Sounds like Ron is making lunch for everyone. <laughs> it's gonna say who's drumming. I just went ahead and muted. Some for me. I muted him for for I muted him for him. <laughs> Someone's chopping something up for a, a, a nice tasty lunch. <laughs> Let's just give it uh, one more minute and then we'll get started. Hi, y'all. Hi. Good morning, Bruce. Good morning. One, one thing I will ask of everyone, uh, if you don't already, grab a, a pen and some paper to take notes. Um, this will be a good one to take notes from. Um, I am looking at participation from a lot of people. Your, your input of what you're using for data, where you're getting it. Um, so with, with everyone's information, I'm sure there'll be a lot of room for note taking. Good. All right, I think, I think we should get started now. So everyone, good morning. Feel free to turn on your, your videos. Uh, I love seeing everyone and haven't seen it, a lot of you for quite some time. So feel free to turn on your video so we can see you. Um, if you have anything to say, feel free to unmute your mic. Uh, this is meant as a open dialogue and open conversation with everyone. We can learn from each other. So to start off, I'm Russ Lassard. I'm the sales manager at the West Seattle office for those who don't know me. Hope everyone is staying healthy and staying top, on top of their real estate business. Today we're going to talk about how are you using data and where are you getting it. We're also going to hear from John Wind uh, from our West Seattle office and how he is incorporating data into his business. Uh, if you haven't met John Wind yet, John Wind often leads our business development class in, on Wednesdays in West Seattle. You, if you're in the West Seattle office, uh, you'll see John's monthly uh, stats that he sends out to the office. So with data, there is a lot of data and statistics out there, but where are we finding it? Okay, one place uh, we, to start out with is our own uh, Berkshire Hathaway quarterly market report. If you haven't seen that already, this is what it looks like. Sorry, it isn't black and white. And this is emailed from Jason Waugh, our own CEO of the company, quarterly. So that's one place you can get real good data numbers, not only for the Puget Sound, but also Southwest Washington and even the Oregon area as well. So if you have potential clients in the Oregon, hey, you can, quickly pop off some data information to give them on how their market is as well. Another place to get that uh, info is uh, market snapshots. So market snapshots, these are on the back end of our websites and they come out every Monday. So the, that's, so if you look here, these are what it looks like. A lot of great information here. So to access, the market snapshot, you'll want to log in to the back end of your website, scroll down to market snapshots, Northwest MLS, and then you'll find the area. They're divided up. Um, you can find Seattle 140 as an example. And there's lots of different areas. One thing I recommend if, if you are going to use the market snapshots to, for their data, follow it consistently. So every Monday, a new report will come out and they break it down very well as far as price range, days on market, months of inventory. 
One other website you can go to is the NAR website, National Association of Realtors, and that is nar.realtor.com. Lots of good information there. And then also we have our very own Northwest MLS. There's lots of different ways to gather data from the MLS. One place I recommend going, just going to the homepage, going to the toolbar, and then finding news and stats. From there, you're gonna see Northwest MLS statistics. You're gonna find current reports. Also, you're gonna find Northwest Reporter along that toolbar, and that will give you a Northwest MLS market snapshot. This is kind of what those look like. You can see it right here. That's just one picture and there's another picture here. These are very good for sending out to clients. I like how um, it, it's more of a, a photo and the statistics are there. And I think it's just really user friendly, look pretty as well, instead of just numbers by itself like this. I think it's a little bit more interac interactive for your clients. And with those, these as well, you can always take, uh, if you use your phone, just take a, a screenshot of it and upload it to your social media. Good place to find content there. Also, in the Northwest MLS, you're gonna find stuff on InfoSparks with fast stats. And I'm gonna have John Wind go over how he uses InfoSparks in his business. And this is kind of what John puts out on a monthly basis, emails out. So I'm gonna have John now kind of uh, go over how he puts this together, why, and how, how, how is he using it with his clients to interact with them? So John, are you there? Yeah. Great. Yeah, well, thanks for us and good morning everybody. Um, so yeah, that's, that's something that I put together. It's uh, all MLS areas in King County, um, just median home price and how it's changed uh, year over year. So April 2020, what's the median uh, sales price and then how is that different from uh, April of 2019? So that's kind of a one page thing that you can either print out and laminate and have in your open houses when we used to do open houses uh, or send digitally um, to your SOI. Uh, and that just kind of covers all areas in King County. So they can kind of see what's their neighborhood doing and they can look at other neighborhoods and see what those neighborhoods are doing as well uh, as it relates to sales price. Um, one thing that I'm gonna try to do here is I'm gonna share my screen with you guys and we're gonna go into InfoSparks a little bit. Um, so bear with me. Um, Russ, I'll have you let me know when this pops up for you. Yes, we can see it. Okay, perfect. Um, so uh, for with InfoSparks, many of you have probably uh, jumped around a little bit in here. Um, I will say that the data in InfoSparks lags behind a little bit. So uh, the most recent data that they have is April of 2020. So anything that's happened uh, here in May is not gonna be reflected in InfoSparks. Um, so it's, it's roughly 30 days behind. So when really talking about what are our current trends like with your clients and people getting ready to, to buy or sell, um, probably wanna be going into uh, matrix and, and finding some uh, properties that are currently active and, and just closed and pending and all that kind of stuff. But as we jump in here, um, the one thing that I talk with people about, about InfoSparks first, is uh, mid-screen over on the right, we have this uh, bar and the default is 12 months. And what that means is that it's grabbing data right now from King County is the um, area that I've put in here. Um, what that's saying is it's, it's gathering median home prices of an average of the last 12 months. So this line is, is, doesn't have much deviation. It's pretty good. It looks good as a graph uh, goes, but um, these numbers are gonna be a little bit different because it's gathering the previous 12 months worth of data. Uh, we have options here for three months of data. 
and we have a little bit more deviation, you know, there's six months, but then there's monthly as well. Monthly is going to have the most deviation. Um, and if you guys can see, as I kind of hover my mouse over this line here, uh, it shows us what the median home price was in King County in, for example, February of 2017. Um, over here on the right, and the reason I'm able to put together that little one sheet that I send out every month uh, relatively quickly is because it'll give me, I'll type in 140 here for West Seattle. So median home price in West Seattle, uh, this is all property types by the way, uh, was $670,000. And then to the right of that number, you see plus 4.4%. So that's, I don't have to do any math. That's just telling me that that number 670 is up 4.4% from where it was last April. Um, so those are some really quick ways to grab some quick stats. So essentially for that sheet, if you wanna know what's happening in area, you know, in Burien, you just do the same thing. Uh, so 465 is the median home price in Burien in April, and that's up 10.7%. Uh, we do have an ability to add an area. So by clicking uh, directly to the right of the first area there, if I wanna say compare area 130 with area 120, uh, we can do that and we can see that we have two lines now on our graph, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, to be able to compare that way. Um, so in terms of what areas you can search, so I, I use this as kind of a high level tool. Um, it's not very good at getting super specific in terms of a neighborhood, although you do have the ability to create your own areas, which I'll go into in a couple minutes. Um, but essentially you can do any MLS area, you can do cities, like if I wanted to do Seattle as a whole, um, you can do counties and you can actually do brokerages and specific brokers if you'd like to. So sometimes if you are putting together a little marketing piece on yourself, you can use this tool to say, you know, hey, type in your own name and say, what's my percent of original price? You know, what are, are my listings selling higher than most realtors listings or are they, you know, lower or right on? Um, so in terms of creating these graphs, I'll leave Normandy Park up there or Burian and I'll type in King County. I use these uh, as tools when I meet with buyers or sellers. Um, I will create a little sheet using these graphs to insert into a CMA, for example, uh, or I may print it off uh, to hand to a buyer in a buyer folder when we first meet. And it's really high level stuff. I just let them know this is kind of an easy way for them to grab a hold of what the market is doing um, in a visual way. So usually for a graph, I might pull uh, a rolling three months to even out the graph a little bit. So there's not quite so much volatility. Um, and here we see we're on median sales price. So this is what sales price has done over the last 10 years uh, in Burien, which is our black line. And then in King County as a whole, which is our green line. Uh, you can do the same thing with inventory. So homes for sale down here on the bottom, these are all gonna populate different graphs. Homes for sale. Uh, so we have the same thing, King County in green. Uh, Burien is down here, kind of this black line. Um, but this is a really good graph for uh, buyers and sellers to see um, as it relates to inventory. So every year we can kind of see there's a peak and a valley of inventory, right? And as we kind of go along our little um, graph here, we can see usually end of the year, uh, January, February is kind of the, the valley of inventory. And then the peak is usually, um, you know, September, uh, August, stuff like that. We also have new listings. So some more severe peaks and valleys, but these are new listings. So how many new listings are coming out per month? Um, so, you know, if sellers are trying to ask you, you know, when's the best time to list my house and you want to talk a little bit about the pros and cons of list listing now versus waiting. Um, no matter the time of year, you can kind of use these graphs to help them understand, uh, you know, how many listings are going to be out roughly and what the, the cyclical market looks like for, for real estate. Um, 
One thing that I will speak on really quickly is capturing screenshots. So uh, I use screenshots all the time. It's a quick way to steal stuff and make it my own. Um, and I'll screenshot a couple of these graphs and put them into a sheet like I was talking about um, for uh, to put into a CMA. So I don't know. Let me see here. I'm going to try to share a different screen with you guys. Russ, are you still looking at InfoSparks right now? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, well, it's not that important for me to show you this sheet, but essentially I'll take a median home price graph and a homes for sale graph to represent price and inventory, put that all on one page um, to be able to insert that into a CMA and, and speak with a seller on that. Um, if you know when your client bought their house, so let's say, you know, they bought in April of 2012. Um, that's kind of a cool tool as well for them to see if their house is in Burien or Normandy Park. Uh, they bought in April 2012. You can do some quick math. You see that the median home price that month uh, was $170,000 and we're now at 472. Um, and sometimes those types of numbers, as we all know, um, sellers can see those numbers and, and it's not quite so important that they absolutely get the tip top, you know, make sure to get the very peak of the market. If you bought in 2012, you've done pretty well. So we don't need to really, um, you know, split hairs in terms of getting five extra dollars for your house. Um, so you can, like I said, I send these out digitally to my clients. Sometimes it sparks conversations. Uh, they're able to see not only their neighborhood, but other neighborhoods in King County as well. Um, I talked earlier about you can actually create an area if you'd like to. So for example, um, you know, in West Seattle, you can pick any neighborhood that you'd like. Uh, we'll do Alki because it's easy to, to kind of define down here. Um, so you can, just like in the MLS, you can draw a polygon or uh, a radius, a circle around a property. Um, what I'll do is I'll go ahead and do a radius, pull it out. Let's say we want to call this Alki. So I want to pull just statistics from this area alone. Once I have my borders, I'll hit save. I'm going to call this test Alki. and it's saved. So, sorry, I skipped over this step, but on, on our top bar here in InfoSparks, over to the right, I was clicked, I clicked on my areas. Um, going back now over into InfoSparks. So now instead of typing a city or uh, area 140, for example, I can just type the area I just created, which is test Alki. And now it's gonna crunch me those numbers uh, for just the houses that have sold uh, in that area. So if you wanna get a little more specific um, for your clients in terms of their exact neighborhood, um, you know, you do have the ability to do that. You kind of set up the parameters of their neighborhood um, and then you can give them a little bit more detail there. Um, as you guys probably know as well with InfoSparks, you do have certain metrics. Um, so if, the, if your clients have a really specific house, like it's, it's larger than most of the houses in the area, maybe you want to do homes, four bedrooms or more. Um, same thing with lot size, if it has a really large lot. Um, you can also specify uh, just condos, you know, if you just want to pull this data for condominiums. Um, and then there's also price ranges uh, over here on the left. Uh, so that's a lot of just information about just how to use InfoSparks, but um, my main tool for this is, is grabbing some um, kind of quick hits or, or uh, sound bites, if you will. So if we say King County, we'll go back here, and homes for sale. So this is all available inventory um, as it was in April of 2020. So for King County, it looks like we are We'll go to monthly. So this is pulling the exact data for just April uh, versus April of 2019. So right now in King County or at the end of April, we had 4,316 uh, available homes and that's down 25% uh, 
uh, over last year. So if you can just memorize that number, 25%, when you're chatting with people at parties or on the phone or whatever, you don't have to go look up statistics. You can just tell people, well, you know, um, yeah, prices are up, but inventory is, is down 25% right now in King County. Um, just a little tool to make you look like an expert um, in front of your friends. <laughs> so um, that's a little bit about InfoSparks. I would open it up to see if anybody has any questions um, on InfoSparks, some of the stuff I just talked about. I, I do have one question, or actually two questions for you, John. Sure. Uh, first question, for, for your business, how, how often do you go into InfoSparks to get data? Uh, for my business, so I'll, in any time um, I have a buyer consultation or a, a seller consultation, I'll definitely dive into InfoSparks to get the latest data, but at, at least once a month, usually about twice a month, um, just to kind of check up on it, but understand the InfoSparks data is monthly. So if you check it at the beginning of the month, you're going to see the same numbers that you do at the end of the month until you hit, um, you know, June, for example. Okay. So, right. so at the minimum, you're consistently on it at least monthly. Yes. Yeah. The, the data there comes out monthly. So I always want to grab that new data and that sheet that I um, send out to the office I just print that out in the office and laminate it and just hold a copy with me. Um, so if I am used to be great at open houses, but we're not doing those right now, but anytime you're chatting with somebody or, or if you're going to go, you know, if you're going to mask up and go have a coffee with somebody in a parking lot or something like that, or over to their house, um, it's good to be able to pull that out so they can kind of see, um, you know, not only what this area is doing, but others as well. Well, it's great too that you sanitize or, uh laminate it because it makes it easier for sanitizing right and you can wipe it down with Lysol that's right my second question for you um, what's the difference because I, I see this on InfoSparks what's the difference between median price and average price when you're pulling up statistics yes so uh, statistics are notorious for being able to be manipulated any way you want right so uh, a lot of times if somebody wants statistics to say a certain thing, they can just kind of mess with the parameters a little bit um, so that it kind of highlights um, what you'd like to, to show. Um, so specifically on sales price, when we're talking about median and average, average is, is what most people think about average. Um, if we have four homes that sold, we're gonna add up those sales price and divide it by four and that'll be our average, right? Uh, the only problem with that is that if most of the houses that sold were 500,000 and then we have the fourth house um, that was a million, that's going to skew that average quite a bit. Um, median just means that the same amount of prices were above this number and the same amount were below. So it's, it's kind of the middle number. So if you have $1 million house and the rest are 500,000, the median is going to be much closer to what kind of the actual numbers are for the market. Um, without being skewed. Um, you know, that's, that, that's what median and average is. I will say uh, one of the reasons I, I try to use statistics when speaking with clients for sure is, is that a lot of times they're able to grasp it, especially in a visual way. If you can kind of manipulate these graphs and be able to print them out or send them to your clients. Um, and, you know, it, it does a lot for them to be able to see what the actual data says rather than you just telling them, oh, trust me, this is the way it is, you know? Yeah, yeah, the, the, num the numbers don't lie. <laughs> we, as agents, we can say all we want, but if we can have something that we can present and, and show the client, you know, the, the, those numbers are, are pretty true. Yeah, and, and also with statistics, you know, like we were talking about with median and average, um, I was talking with Calvin about this a couple weeks ago. Sometimes if you just say, okay, what has, uh, you know, West Bellevue done uh, this month versus last year? It looks like you, some, some people would say, oh my gosh, West Bellevue is up 30%. Wow, it's going crazy. But it, you also have to look at your data set, right? So how many houses closed? If there was only 10 units that closed, obviously the data is going to be skewed because that's not a large sample size. The, the larger the sample size, the more accurate the data. So so some of those numbers, if, if you're pulling these numbers and they look really, really crazy, um, sometimes that's why, you know, maybe there's, um, 
some data that's skewing it, or maybe it's just a small sample size, so it's affected um, quite a bit that way. Great. Anything else from anybody? Anyone have questions? Uh, feel free to un uh, unmute yourself and ask uh, ask questions. Hey, John. Yeah. Uh, hi, it's Deb. Do you do you use price per square foot? Uh, do you use this for price per square foot? Uh, I don't specifically use uh, InfoSparks for price per square foot. I, I do look at price per square foot um, if and when I have comps that I've pulled from the MLS mm -hmm. um, and, and kind of I get the data that way. Um, but to me, unless you go in and you create an area with that drawing tool, price yeah. per square foot, it's, it's going to be, um, that's, a, that's really, it, that's kind of specific to neighborhood. And all I'm going to be able to do here, for example, is pull like area 140. Um, and so for a specific house, I'd probably want to grab some comps to use price per square foot. Yeah, yeah and I, I meant for area. Okay, yeah. I mean, it's, it could be interesting to your clients, right? Like some mm -hmm. of these are just meant for conversation starters. So mm -hmm. uh, if you want to kind of put together a little marketing piece that says, you know, hey, West Seattle, here's your price per square foot, pending sales, average price, new listings, blah, blah, blah. Um, just as a conversation starter. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's great. That's what InfoSparks is good at is providing you with that information quickly. Great. Thanks, John. Yeah. Anyone else, anyone getting data for their business outside the MLS or they're using something different within the MLS for, for their data and statistics? We'd love to hear from you. I guess I'll add in again, uh, since I've already spoken once and I have courage. <laughs> um, I, I'm still messing with it, but I attend, attended one of the trainings uh, by the Northwest Most Listing Service on HomeSpotter. And um, I guess I can share my self here. Um, and it was, there's a lot of data within HomeSpotter that you can, that you can create using, using the HomeSpotter app. And that the trainings, all the trainings um, are um, available um, on, they, they tape all their trainings so you can find them on the Northwest Multiple Listing site to get in there and, and learn a bit, little, learn more about how you do it. And like I said, I'm still learning myself, but there's, that can be used really, really quickly too. Great. No, great for sure. It's a home spotter. Mm-hmm. Is HomeSpotter and HomeSnap the same? They're different. Okay. And I don't fully understand why. Do you, John, win? Uh, so they're, they're really similar. They're, they, they're both used for kind of searching property um, for both you and your client. But the main difference that I've found is HomeSpotter makes it really easy to do different ads for your listings or for yourself. Or I'm sorry, HomeSnap is uh, is easier to do ads for yourself or for your properties um, whether that's on Waze or google or instagram you can create them right from there um, and set a budget and they'll go send it out for you um, and you can create mini cmas uh, as well it's it kind of has like a zillow zestimate feature where um, in home snap you can kind of zoom in and, and it'll tell you roughly what it thinks the market value is of any specific property um, my only, the reason I still use Home Spotter uh, for myself is, unless they've changed it in the last like two months, you can't see the supplements on a listing in Home Snap, but you can see the supplements on Home Spotter. Yeah. Um, so that's why when I'm on the go, I like to use Home Spotter just so I have access to that. I'm super new. What do you mean by supplements? Oh, yeah, they're just uh, documents that the uh, listing agent has uploaded with the listing. So yeah, I think I think it has it now because I have a lot of friends who've been sending me Zillow, Realtor.com, like all these other ones. And I'm like, please send me HomeSnap, um, download this app because I'll get the MLS information. And yeah, I think you can download like all documents like disclosure from it too now. Okay, yeah, like the legal description and Form 17 oh, yeah, and all that. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Well, then they, they might have correct, corrected that, and um, that's great. Yep. It's been a really easy way for me to get the information from them without, like, 
taking the extra step of me going on Zillow and then me searching on another website, it's like a big headache. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Does anyone know, is one of them, uh, is this the one where you sign your, your buyer up and then you're kind of like their exclusive agent on that format? Does that ring a bell uh, yeah. to anyone? I think that that's Home Snap. So when when they first came out with Home Snap, and anybody else, feel free to jump in here. But my understanding of it was when they first uh, brought out Home Snap, if you send your Home Snap app to your clients for them to download, once they download it, um, it's branded to you, and it, it they'll have Bruce's face on whenever they go on Home Snap. But if another agent tries to get them to download their home snap, it like won't work or it'll still be branded to Bruce because he got right. there first. Right. A friend of mine uh, got his <laughs> realtor license and then sent this out to a bunch of people like myself, my wife and others. So I'm getting this from him at least once a week. And now I'm wondering if, if when I try to get my SOI to go on there, are they going to, since we have common friends, are they going to see all these and only be able to go to him and not me? I guess I'll find out by trying to get my friends on there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or, or you could contact home snap as well. Um, whenever yeah. I've had any issues on home snap, they've actually been really responsive and um, got back to me quickly with answers, which is nice. Um, but you know, everybody uses apps and technology and statistics uh, their own way. Um, and for, for me specifically, I know I would love it if everybody would download my app when I asked them to. And every single time they looked at property info, it was me and my face. But I know they go on Redfin, they're on Zillow, they're on all kinds of stuff. Really, I just want to keep in touch so that they uh, still know that I'm their realtor when it comes time to make the move. No, that's great. Anyone else? Well, I'll kind of share how, how I, where I get my data and how I use it. So for me, what I use, I, it's just the MLS every day. My morning routine is to go on MLS and go and look at my hot sheets as well as my saved searches. So I'll have about five or six saved searches for different criteria and, and different areas. And I'll look at those every morning, minimum. Sometimes I'll look at it two or three times a day so with my safe searches and hot sheets, I'm looking at new listings that come out. How many new listings are coming out? I'll look at the, the pendings. So with, with pendings, whether it's pending or pending inspection, I'll see how long it was on the market before it went pending. You know, a lot of these homes are going pending inspection or pending after two or three days was kind of telling me that, hey, we're still in a, a hot market. I'll look at expireds. We don't see a lot of expireds, but expireds and cancels do come out. So if you're someone who is soliciting listings from expires or cancels, you'll want to know when they come out as well. And then I'll look at the just solds. So just solds, I'll look at, I'll scroll down to the very, well, I'll look at first see with the just solds, what it sold for. How was that in relation to the actual list price? And then I'll sc scroll down to the very bottom of that listing, sold listing, and I'll look at who sold it and if there was any closing cost involved. So if it sold for 20,000 more or, but they gave 10,000 towards uh, closing costs, well, we know the value was only up 10,000 or if it sold for list price and then they gave 10,000 towards closing costs, well, that could tell me, well, market might be a little bit softer because they gave in instead of going up. So I kind and of just, Russ, Russ, yes. You can only see that if the agent took the time to enter that when he put it pending, right? Or put it sold. When it's sold, correct. Yeah. And, and most agents are, are good at that. Maybe yeah. not mm -hmm. all of them. Not all of them. But I, I will use that to kind of see, to guide me where, where the market is at. Um, going back to the new listings, with the new listings, I'll go through and read the remarks and see if there's a seller review period. In the hottest markets, we're always seeing seller review dates. Mixed market, we'll see a, a combination of both. 
And if the marketing is soften, if the market is softening, then we're going to see less seller review dates. So that's kind of how I keep up on the market on a day to day basis. Um, for me, I like going day to day because, because it kind of shows me what the trend of the market is. A lot of data and statistics that come out, they're 30 days behind. So if you're getting your data from the Seattle Times or a quarterly report or NAR, that's data from previous months. So if you're consistent enough to look at the MLS every day and look at certain areas, you're gonna be able to keep on top of the, the market and the data and kind of know what the trend is. For me, the trend is important because when I talk to potential buyers, I wanna know, hey, are we gonna be in a multiple offer situation? Are we gonna have room to negotiate price down? Uh, with listings, I, I, I wanna know what the data is telling me. So when I talk to my potential seller, can we have an offer review date? Can we push the price up to the top end of the market? Or do we need to come down a little bit? Um, one thing I, other thing I do just to add on top of that, Monday or Tuesdays in the office, when I see agents in the office, I'll ask them, hey, do you have an open house this weekend? How was your open house? And I kind of look at those agents, what, what their traffic is for their open houses, but make sure you talk to multiple agents because one agent can have 20 people come through their open house. Another agent might have, have, have one. And kind of ask them, you know, where it was at, you know, what hours you're open, because even that, those numbers there can kind of tell you how the, kind of tell you how the market is. If both open houses had 20, 30, 40 people coming through to tour, hey, it's telling you there's a hot market out there. And that's a number you aren't going to see printed anywhere. So you can get data too from your fellow real estate agents. So keep that in mind too, to kind of have a pulse on what's going on right now in the market. So that's kind also of- also ask that question and you'll, you'll get a big difference between uh, Boulevard Park and Seahurst or Normandy Park, for example. Right, and a lot of times it depends on how long the home has been on the market. Uh, brand new listing, you might have 30 potential buyers through and one that's been on for two weeks, you might only have two, three, zero. So you kind of want to know how long the homes have been on the market as well. But that's uh, another way to use data, even if it's not printed, to kind of see what the trend of the market is. And that's just me. This, this is how, what I do for, for my business, and it varies for everyone. And that's why I think it's great that we're having an open discussion. So I'd love to hear from anyone else, you know, what really, what are you doing? Because I, I can learn from everyone here as well and bring it to my business. I've got a, another question, Russ. Yes. Um, recently I've been dealing with someone up in uh, Snohomish County and then West Seattle. So I sent my, it, these are different people. So I set my hot, no, I set my market watch up for area 140. But then I find myself wanting to know what's going on in area 600, for example. So I need to change it all the time. Is there a way to set up a, a market watch or something? Or maybe it's a hot sheet for both areas? I don't so, do a lot with uh, market watch. I would defer to John on that. But as far as hot sheets, yeah, I would have a hot sheet for, for, for each area. Okay. Or, uh, or a safe search. You can do a safe search instead of just like a hot sheet. Yeah. Because okay. I, I do that for several areas. I'll try that. Thanks. I have five different areas that I use for safe searches. You know, area 140, area 130, and then there's a few other areas that I look at every day to kind of see what's going on in those locations. And it basically keeps you on top of the market and makes you the, the expert. So if you have someone contacting you right away, tomorrow, if you're watching these certain areas every day, you're going to be on top of it. You're not going to have to go back and look. You should be able to provide them the information right then and there. And that's why it's good for, you know, any kind of data research, be consistent with it. For me, John, John's consistent, you know, 
one or two times a month going on InfoSparks. And he's coming in other times for specific clients as well. For me in the MLS with my save searches, it's every day, you know, minimum, you know, once a day, sometimes two or three, uh, depending on if my clients are looking in that area. Any of the newer agents that we have on, what, what are you doing for your, your, your uh, data and how are you accessing data for your business? Would anyone like to share? Um, I've just been using the MLS and doing comparables, which is taking a lot of time. So I'm really grateful for this information. And um, yeah, I think I'll use the Info Snap. Yeah, Info Sparks. Sparks. <laughs> um, snap info sparks snap app there's an app for that remember remember too that um the mls puts out uh you know monthly um reports and things of that nature that you can get a quick reference shot on and um i know russ you had talked about the quarterly report from from jason and i apologize because i i did i was uh, making calls back to some agents early on but did we talk about uh, you know jason puts out an email every sunday that has updates uh, with stats of things that are going on. That's a great uh, resource. Um, you know, I think a lot of times when you're getting information you or, or stats, you're really trying to take in things that have impact so that when you are trying to talk with people along the way that you meet throughout the week or that you talk to um, at open houses or whatever, of course, we're not doing open houses right now, but that you have some of those kind of hot button topics that you can make comment to. And it really shows, I mean, the whole thing about data and being able to utilize it is to show how much you know, right? Sorry, I know my video is off. Hold on, I'll turn that back on. Um, is to to be able to show, yeah, this is this is me, right? I'm I'm a I'm a knowledgeable real estate agent that knows what's going on in the marketplace, right? I was talking with a client this last week, and I was able to rattle off all kinds of things after they told me that the real estate market was uh, was dead right now in Seattle, and that's what they're hearing on the news, right? But then I was able to go through and go, well, this, 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 and this. And, and uh, kind of debunked that and they went, wow, actually, if that's true, then I would like to purchase a house right now, right? And so it's being able to do that. That's what the power of the data is really for us is being able to come uh, to, to be that trusted advisor that can show that we know what the heck is going on and we're not just relying on our feelings or uh, the, the local, uh, you know, the five o'clock news. No. Hey, can I just say, I always use the, the recap the monthly recap with the breakouts that come out at the start of the new month for the past month i call it cocktail party stats mm -hmm. i pick three to four items and i just memorize them i work out of burien so area 130 is up 11.18 percent i'm having a conversation in the grocery store that number comes to mind king county as a whole is up four percent and you can choose i mean you never want to be well, this is down 28%. You, you always want to kind of pick which numbers you're going to remember for that month. But just like you said, being able to rattle off three or four statistics in a conversation, it's perfect to let people know that you know what you're doing. It gives you instant legitimacy. I see Andrea asked about Pierce County. You can pull out the breakouts for Pierce County. Bruce was asking about Area 600. You can pull out the breakouts for Area 600. So great information. I'm going to do a share screen. I'll jump on the MLS real quick. If I can get there. One second. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yes. So this is the home page, and from the home page on the MLS, just go right here to news and stats. Click on that, and then here you go. You have North Northwest MLS statistics. Click on that. Rook. So you have these reports here, all area recaps. I'll click on this real quick. So yeah, people are strictly numbers people showing all the percentages of everything here. New listings for April versus new, new listings for April 2019. So that's a, a huge difference there. Pending sales, closed sales. 
jump back here. So I encourage everyone just to go into the MLS and play around. You know, look for the, the statistics that appeal to you. Because if you do that, you're more likely to go back to those statistics and view them multiple times and get better and start remembering it and seeing trends. And that way you're always gonna be on top of the market and have that information to bring to your clients or those people you run into. Another one here, Northwest Reporter I'll pull up. This goes back, this is every month. So here we have market snapshots here. Here's the infographic. And this is why I showed earlier that was in black and white. Let's scroll down here. And these would be good too. If you, if you do this on your phone, take a screenshot and you can post it on your social media. Good number to know right now is available inventory. You know, 1.75 months of inventory. That's a, always a good indicator if we're in a buyer's market or seller's market. It's showing right now we're still in a seller's market. So if you need anything for social media, pull this up on your cell phone, take a snapshot, post it. Be that resource for your clients. Back out of this. So Russ, I have a question. Uh -huh. um, I have some clients who are looking specifically for um, like good areas with schools. So I noticed on the HomeSnap app, I could um, use that data to filter homes uh, that have schools that are like six plus, seven plus. Uh, is there any resource in the MLS that will give me more information about areas of schools? Oh, great question. No, I don't. I don't think that the MLS uh, does school information. Uh, Where does I guess HomeSnap get their school ratings, and how do I how do I crunch those numbers? I think I there's something on the back end of our website, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, but that's not where HomeSnap would be scraping. There, there, they, there's a website. They get them from great schools. Yeah. Oh, great schools! Thank you. Mm -hmm. But can I just say, please don't determine for your clients what good schools are. Refer them to greatschools.org or let them read the HomeSnap app. Don't decide for them that an area is good based off of your interpretation of a good school. Yeah. Okay. Well, because I, I was getting, um, they were sending me a house to look at and I was like, oh, that looks like this house. And then I sent them a house and they were like, oh, but the schools are really bad in that area. So we wouldn't want that house. So I was like, okay, well, how do I, how do I okay, compare so school I, zones if I'm not a parent myself? You don't need to compare school zones. You're just going to say, so what areas do you want me to help you search in? Okay. And let them tell you. Simpler. Okay. Absolutely. Because you don't ever want to determine my evaluation is different from yours. Yours is different from theirs. Well, you can get yourself in some serious discrimination situations as well. Absolutely. That, right. So you, you never really want to be determining where somebody else wants to live, even based on information that you can find out there in the public, right? Rely on them to go find it and then tell you what they want. So make sure they're aware of great schools, for example, as a source, but they can check their other sources and then ask them if there are particular districts or schools they want to look at and you can search that way. Yeah, this would also apply to like, if people ask if, you know, if uh, crime statistics in an area or things of that nature. I mean, again, you can look that stuff up all day long, but so can they and they can decide. I mean, really, if they look anywhere, they're going to be unhappy no matter where they look, right? <laughs> if you've ever had a client try to find a safe place to live, good luck. Uh, you know, I mean, it's just kind of kind of the situation we're, we're in. But Yeah, thank you. It's just that school question came up and I was like, ooh, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, can, can I just add really quick on uh, Nalani's point um, about kind of instant legitimacy? I know 
we're in social distancing time now, so things like birthday parties and stuff like that isn't as prevalent, but um, as we get back to kind of a new normal, um, you can go on the MLS really quickly. If you know you're going to a birthday party or a, a friend get together at somebody's house, go on the MLS um, before you go and just see really quickly, you know, what houses have sold on their block recently, what's been going on, um, because that stuff's gonna come up. And it's, it's kind of a bonus because you'll be in a conversation with maybe just the person who lives there, but other people in the room are listening to you go, oh yeah, that's crazy that your neighbor down the street, you know, they sold for $40,000 more than, than their list price. Um, and then obviously your friends are, are impressed that you're able to stay on top of their neighborhood so well. Um, but that's just a quick, it just takes five minutes before you go to the party to do that. And that's really good. You don't want to be standing there and they're talking about the yellow house on the corner. And, uh, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great time to pull out your home snap. Yeah, there you go. I was just going to point out, yeah, especially with John's point, you can actually go in, look at the homes, and view the interior pictures. Because if there's something like very distinct about that house, whether it's a paint color or anything, if you can bring that up during that conversation, they're going to know that you saw the interior of that home. It's going to make you look even better. <laughs> Home Snap has the search nearby function too. So while you're standing at their house, you can click the search nearby and what they ask. I'm like, wow, well, let's see. Click and that's kind of a handy tool. Yeah, I used Home Snap a lot over the weekend and wish I'd been using it for a lot longer. It has more, uh, more on it and, and more importantly, getting my clients to use it and then sending me uh, what they like through that, I can search better. I don't know about you guys, but I also kind of like um, the, the home snap. You can also look up the agent that you're working with very, very quickly, mm -hmm. right? So if you, if you click on the pro agents, you've got, you've got an opportunity. You can type in the agent's name that you're working with and you can get kind of an idea of, you know, do they do a lot of business? Do they not do a lot of business? Um, those types of things are, are not necessarily, can't base all of your decisions on that, right? Because we all know veteran agents that are absolutely horrible uh, and don't know anything that's going on. And we also know new agents that are phenomenal and are dialed in at a very fast uh, rate and, and even though they may not have a lot of transactions, they may know what they're doing uh, quite a bit. But for a lot of, uh, in a lot of ways, that can kind of help, kind of um, help you through a process or, or, or right away, kind of uh, sizing up the other agent in a way, right? But just kind of getting an idea of okay, if it's a newer agent, maybe I need to be more hands on with them, or if it's a more veteran agent, you know, maybe I need to be paying attention to this or that. So. John, what's, or uh, Russ, what's next week's topic? Next week's top topic is, uh, what has the lockdown taught you about your business? It's going to be my favorite topic. I love it. Yes. So we're looking for a lot of <laughs> discussion, because definitely feedback from everyone out there. You know, what are you doing? What have you learned, you know, over the last couple of weeks, right? It's only been a couple of weeks, right? Yeah. yeah. A couple of weeks. A couple of weeks. <laughs> it's been well, the, the, Stops, right? the what is, is it going to be, yeah, is it going to be like, is it seven, is this week seven or week eight? I think this is week eight, actually. I think it is. We're going to go with that. Because I think we've done six sales meetings. This will be the seventh, but we didn't do one the first week. So I think this is week eight. Anyway, or we're going to be entering week eight here in a day. So Nalani, I know Nalani's looking. I can tell you're earnestly trying to count the weeks. I can see you, Nalani. I know you are. I knew it. All it's right. Definitely well, good. eight. Good, good, good. All I'm right. I'm so busted. Yes, I'm counting the week. <laughs> nice. Any final questions or final comments from anyone? Um, I just want to celebrate real quick. I updated my home office, so I'm really excited. <laughs> <laughs> New new digs, uh, so reinvested in myself. Nice. I want to thank you all for all the information. This is just really, really, really useful. Yeah. And a lot of it I knew before, but it reminds me to go back to it. Oh, thank yep. you.
That's it. Like anything, just take a thing or two, right? Go, go check yeah. out, you know, National Association of Realtors uh, stats. I mean, there's some right. really fascinating things there that you can pull out. Just, just use a thing or two, right? Don't, don't, don't do it all at once. Awesome. Thanks, Russ. All right. Take care, everyone. And we'll see you next week and have a great and productive week. Nice. Bye. Thank you. Bye.